All those movies. Ocean's Eleven, that, that's a good example. You know, you recruit these guys because this guy was this and that guy. I mean, it's a cool concept, but no, it, it really it would ever happen that way. For Anthony Curcio, he pulled off the perfect crime, almost. I planned out an armored car robbery where I dressed in blue shirt, blue hat, safety vest, and a wig basically to look like a city worker. And before the crime happened, I posted an ad on Craigslist. And I don't know how many uh, people showed up to the bank, but I requested that they wear a blue shirt, blue hat, safety vest, so everyone looked uniform. And on Tuesday at 11 o'clock on September 30th, 08, the Brinks armored car pulled in and there was 10, 15 people in one corner and then another six or seven people in the other corner. And then there was one person that was on his own. As soon as uh, they wheeled in the money, I came in from behind and pepper sprayed the armored car driver, took the money, ran across the highway and stripped off all of my clothes, threw it on the ground and am known for escaping on an inner tube because it was like separating. There was a little stream that went underneath the uh, freeway. I could go underneath the stream on the inner tube, come out the other side, and even though distance-wise they're very close, in order for a vehicle to get from here to there, it would probably be about 15, 20 minutes. So when the police showed up at the scene, here there was uh, 16, 17 of these people all dressed in blue shirt, blue hat, safety vest, and matching the description. The purpose of that was just to create enough confusion just to buy me a little bit of time. So I did actually get away. I was actually caught before the crime even happened, about a week prior to the crime. I wanted to know how long it would take me to get from the bank down to the river on the inner tube across to the other side of this, this freeway. During that time run, it was uh, a hot day for Seattle, so I took off the, the blue shirt, blue hat, and I was wearing different clothes underneath, and I put these items behind a dumpster by a grocery store. A homeless man, he started saying, hey, I know what that is, you know, you know, what's the wig for? I get my items, I go back to the car, and I drove off, and I sat in the car, and I just remember thinking, geez. In the middle console, I had magnetic dealer plates that were just bogus, and I, I remember thinking, I'm not doing anything illegal, I don't need to put these on. They just sat there, and I remember looking at them after I saw that homeless man, I'm like, oh man, why didn't I put these things on? In 2008, when the market crashed, I had been buying and flipping properties, and it was like, you couldn't lose. It didn't matter what I buy by the time that like, the whole deal closed, and maybe I'd made $50,000 just because the equity was rising that fast. Well, then all of a sudden, I had all these properties. Even though I had interested buyers in them, I couldn't sell them. Uh, no one could get a loan anymore. I kept thinking, okay, I'm gonna get out of this. Eventually, someone can get a loan, but then they were like requiring, it went from 0% down, they'll give anybody a loan. Overnight, it went to like, okay, basically 25%. Well, who the hell's got 25% down? My point is, is I was unable to sell any of the properties that I owned at the time. Pretty soon, you know, my savings was totally depleted. My wife and I were having another baby at the time. And, you know, being like the man, uh, I guess, you know, in my head, it's like all my value came from like providing. The week later, the robbery happens. And the difference here was that normally when people are like watching about a bank robbery, most of the time people are like, oh, you know, scumbag, this and that. But that was a different time. It was literally a day after the $700 bailout of the banking system by the government. The banking system that got this money interest free it's not like they bailed out all of the people that were losing their homes. So people were pissed, really pissed off. And that changed like the public perspective of all this. And it created like this thing when they couldn't catch, you know, whoever this guy that did this was. And people were like rooting for whoever it was to get away. What do you got? The Holy Grail. The Union Depository, and they say it cannot be hit. I gotta make a big take. Oh, well, gems it is then. Yeah, it's gonna be kind of hard to do a mission without the cheat codes, though. That's the thing is, is it makes the game funner for like, it's kind of like real life. <laughs> you know, you get the cheat codes and it's like, oh, I can get this faster, I can get that, I have a, all this money, and, and then it totally like def 
deflates the game like funness though. Okay, let's get this done. Press to enter Glass's hidden camera. It's like, yeah, well you can record whatever you're looking at, but guess what, they're recording you too. You don't think they're gonna look back? <laughs> thank you, sir, thank you. Sir, thank you. This shot is useless. Shut up, man. What we got? A security camera and the alarm system. Yeah, which I'm all on. Good work, now speak to the assistant and see if there's anything else we need to know. Oh, exactly, that's a good idea. Just long enough so she remembers me. Yeah, look at me, remember this face. I'm gonna take a look around, think about it. Come back to you, baby. I'm gonna go look around, think about it. Then I'll come back, baby. <laughs> She'll never remember that. I'm on the roof. All right, use the glasses to get me a shot of Angelico's roof unit. It'll be right above the store. Wait, I'm on the building of? Get the out of here. Why did I go into the store? The dude already knew that was in there. Why did I go in there? The reason for committing this crime is because the dude owes the money to the guy. 2.5 million. And he has no insurance. Yeah, they're all talking tough here, but you know what? As soon as the feds come knocking, throwing 20 years at you, guess what? All your homeboys will sell you out in a heartbeat. There's two ways I see of doing this. We go in smart, or we go in loud and dumb. Well, you know, the more stuff you got, the more complicated it is. Like in my crime, you know, anytime that you involve too many things, it's a lot of things that could go wrong. Nothing ever goes right. But, because I would like to try to do it smart. Select personnel with that in mind. As ever, the better they are, the bigger the cut. It's ridiculous picking somebody you don't know. I mean, to do something that, uh, you know, the chances of one of these guys getting caught, like, is this dude a drunk? Is he gonna go, yeah, they're talking about driving and composure, the stuff they should be asking about is like, you know, how solid has this dude been? Has he ever done time before? Well, because it will increase my odds of getting away, I'll go with Christian Feltz, but that dude is a snitch. Have you ever seen like five pesticide people come in? And these guys have never met before. Yeah, this is so unrealistic. All those movies, Ocean's Eleven, that, that's a good example is, you know, you recruit these guys because this guy was this and that guy, I mean, it, it's a cool concept, but no, it, it really it would, I don't think it's ever happened that way. It comes down to like loyalty, really, and trust. At the higher levels of, you know, that type of stuff from ex my experience, are, we're actually the people that were like more trustworthy than a lower level person, the guys that, you know, are in it for like the long haul, I guess. They're the, you know, if you're screwing people over all the time, they're not gonna have any, they're not gonna stay in business. It's no different than any other business. Yeah, you can get a quick lick on somebody, but then, you know, in the long run, you're gonna end up losing money. And the people that are willing to screw people over for nothing are the ones that are gonna stay as like a low level whatever. So if I miss though, it just creates a smoke, a smoke signal for cops. Think about it like this. I mean, I always say that I told him to fix that goddamn AC. Good, yeah, pull out the guns before you go in there. Let's do this. Hey, we got to walk. Come on. Oh, 5 0. -oh. So for the last time, move it. Hey, get the fuck out of my face. Oh, it's go time. Oh, oh, yeah. Stay close. Oh, what is it? How many does it say I made? Five, five mil? Yeah, that's another thing. It's like anything you try to steal, like an item. So if someone steals a painting or whatever, that's another unrealistic thing. If say that he owes dude 2.5, what, is he gonna sell this for? So I stole 4.95 mil worth of jewelry that I'll be able to sell for about 30 grand. Uh-oh, lost my crew. If someone's willing to get into a tunnel, they most likely would have already gotten away. We're all good here. I mean, really, we should just be dropping off all this shit somewhere. And get rid of these freaking outfits, man. Okay, we're free. They send 50 cop cars, but no choppers. Lester's waiting for us at the lockup. Okay, let's go see Lester. See, they already have a buyer lined up or what? Like, where are we meeting? Get out of here. Keep our heads this down. warehouse. It's like you got the money to buy a warehouse that's right in the city. I want you to stop by the house a little later on. We'll celebrate, all right? Huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, man. We're back in action. Yeah, in reality, one of those guys that you did it with would have been like an undercover cop. It's heist pass, yay. Because of the homeless man and what he saw that day during the trial run, I was eventually sentenced to six years in federal prison for armored car robbery. 
it was considered a non-violent type of robbery only because I did not use a actual deadly weapon. I signed for five, but the judge ended up giving me an extra year because of those people that I brought to the scene of the crime uh, dressed the way I was. I basically put them in danger, you know. I spent seven months in solitary confinement and I still don't really know the reason why. I went insane. I mean, I really did. And it was like, I was fighting and I had this rage in me and it was just like, I don't know. I, I, I finally just took accountability like, hey Anthony, you know, you only have you to blame. You're the one that got you here. You know, I just kept thinking about my kids and how they're growing up without a dad. You know, that was one thing that I just could not accept. I'd started drawing pictures, you know, just little pictures or whatever. And if they liked Elmo, I'd draw pictures of Elmo, like saying happy birthday or whatever it was. And then these pictures got more and more in depth. And the way that I looked at it was like, okay, well, they may be able to look back 10 years from now and say, you know what, my dad made a mistake. But one thing I do know is my dad loves me. Because even though those drawings suck, <laughs> you know, my drawings weren't very good. Uh, there was no doubt that I put a lot of effort into it. That's how everything kind of started. And when I was released, after the seven months, I was transferred to a prison in Florida. And when I came out of there, I was never the same. I mean, I really, um, I didn't talk to anybody. All my time was spent on basically making these books for my kids. And then it was just like, wow, you know, it brought me a peace. Finally, I was like doing something that wasn't for me. And I fell in love with it and I came home and I tried to get a lot of these, you know, these works, I guess, published. I was laughed at, you know, pretty much made a fool of. I'd stay up until like three in the morning, like trying to learn these programs on how to get my paper illustrations into like vector illustration. It took like five years, but uh, with some luck, I all of a sudden, you know, hit a bestseller. My kids were in elementary school and, you know, parents of, uh, their friends. There was no hiding from, from who I was, what I did. The number one instincts we all have is to protect, you know, our young. So of course, you know, of course they're, they're gonna be cautious around me. I don't blame them for that. And just knowing that it didn't make it any easier because as much as like I, I had changed, no one knows that, you know, they, all they know is my past. So yeah, when playing this game, of course I look back and I'm like, hey, I used to be involved with this kind of stuff and guys and organized crime. And it's like, you know, when I think back to that, it doesn't seem real, but it was really. I mean, I am just blessed to have been given a second chance to be able to see my kids grow up, you know, go to eventually someday see, you know, them get married and then all these first things that I'm still a part of. And I value my time. I value my time with them so much because I lost that time.